The reality is when you do that, you're pushing away a part of you. These are not my words. I'm not speaking from my heart yet. This sounds really fluffy and I don't like it. Oh no. So you'll do all this work and you think, oh, I feel so much better and bang. Greetings, folks. Welcome to another edition of Adventures in Perfect Living. I'm Greg Willits from RosaryArmy.com. And I'm Jennifer Willits, his wife. And uh, it's, this is going to be an interesting one. If you've been listening to our show for a while, then you know that I have come clean over the last several years of talking about my own journeys with mental health issues. And so it's something that uh, has become, unfortunately, near and dear to us. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it all the time. It's a but, defining part but, of our life. <laughs> but it really has become a defining part of our life. And uh, it's something that we've heard from so many of you that you've enjoyed these conversations because whether you or someone that you know deals with mental health issues, what I'm excited about for this particular episode is that we can talk about it very, very much from a Catholic perspective and actually the integration of prayer in our healing for whatever mental health issues, particularly in regards to trauma. Um, our guest today in studio recording, uh, Dr. Jerry Crete. I've known Jerry for a few years now. I was actually in a men's group with him a few years ago with our dear friend Mac and Matt Frad and Danny and uh, John Henry and all, all these guys who, right after I moved back to Georgia, you welcomed me into your group. And then I, I promptly left because of <laughs> my mental health issues, quite honestly, took me out of it. I was like, I can't handle this nope. much closeness right now. And I was gone. So here it is four years later. And Dr. Jerry Crete has written a book called Litanies of the Heart, which deals with helping people pray and find healing. So we're going to be diving into that. Uh, the thing I, I, I'd like to say about Jerry is, number one, he's a very smart guy. He's a very um, faithful guy. And um, he's someone, one of the few adult males that I know that I can argue with over the most important question that we'll start this show with, which is DC or Marvel, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to choose? Like, does it, is it Star Wars, Star Trek, DC, yeah. Marvel? Can't we have it all? <laughs> Just bring it all together. Well, thank you for being here. Welcome to the program. Thanks for coming Great over. Great to be here. Um, this, is, this is a book that you've been working on for a while. You were actually my, my cousin sent me an email and said, have you ever heard of EMDR? And right around the same time, you were the first person in person that ever brought up, have you ever heard of EMDR? And it's been kind of a life-changing thing. And I want to get into the book. Right. But I don't know where to start. If we, I, you know, EMDR is something I think that we should talk about a little bit. But let's talk about your professional life in terms of what made you go in this direction of psychology in the first place. Right, right. Well, I mean, I worked as a high school teacher. Then I moved into school counseling uh, for a number of years. What did you teach in high school? Uh, I taught English and history. I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I moved into school counseling and loved that and then decided to do a doctorate and, uh, in counseling and marriage and family therapy. And then it just kind of took off from that. I started doing clinical work uh, and, uh, and just loved it. Um, so, so, you know, uh, professionally, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I've worked uh, pretty exclusively with Catholic practices. In my own practice, Transfiguration is is Catholic, and all our therapists are Catholic. And I mean, we'll work with anyone, of course, but but we specialize in helping Catholic families and couples. It, have you branched into the online counseling? Do you do online stuff, or is it all in person? No, no. Everyone has done online now since COVID, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. I was already had started doing it before then. So yeah, definitely do telehealth. Um, I love it, actually. At first, it was an adjustment. Um, but now, actually, I probably uh, do about two and a half days uh, telehealth and one and a half days in person. It, and that's transfigurationcounseling.com. Yes, that's right. So, Well, I have a question about the, because yeah. you brought it up in your identity of your practice, that there's a real Catholic lens through which you work. How important is that? I mean, because there's a lot of people who aren't sure if they should pursue a Catholic therapist or just a regular therapist, and does it matter? Um, does it help that you have a match in faith as to your client? Does that come into the counseling that you offer? And is right. that a prerequisite for someone? Yeah. No, and it's not a prerequisite at all, um, uh, as far as anybody coming to, to work with me or anybody in our practice. Um, what I will say is that there's different levels that people might need or want. Mm -hmm. So it really is more focused on the clients themselves. So for some people, just knowing that the therapist is Catholic, the therapist is going to 
isn't going to like suggest a, an abortion or a divorce or anything contrary to the faith, or even that the therapist isn't going to look look at them funny because they're you know not using birth control or because they have mm-hmm. certain life values. So first of all, there's just a sense of acceptance. Okay, we're, we're not having to argue this, and in fact, they get that. You know, the therapist understands my faith and respects it, and also sees it as valuable, and a, and that the spiritual aspect is actually important part of healing the whole person. So, um, so, the, so the different elements there, but another aspect though, and only again, if this is something the client wants, but often, especially in something like EMDR work, um, if you're open to, you know, the Holy spirit, <laughs> if you're open to, um, Christ working, um, uh, in the healing process, I have seen phenomenal things happen you know, because because I'm open to it and the client is that, um, you know, God works through therapy uh, when you're when you invite him and when, when you're open to it. So uh, that's certainly not a prerequisite. Uh, we can work with people who are atheists, agnostics or any religion whatsoever. But I must say in my heart, I love working with people when when they when we're you know involving their faith. Yeah. You, so we've both mentioned EMDR now. What talk about that? Is that is that the core um, methodology that you use, or is it just one of many? It's um, I have it's one of many in a sense that I can use uh, at this point. And, I am, and explain it for people who aren't. Familiar yeah, I'll with explain it. I, I really, basically, right now, primarily use two types of therapy, and they often go hand in hand. And that's EMDR, and the other one is parts work, which I think we'll talk about later. Yeah, but. Um, EMDR actually, I came to first because I was focusing on trauma and treating trauma, and and it is uh, a methodology that is uh, pretty um, uh, well respected, very effective uh, way of treating trauma. So, essentially, EMDR. I mean, I think you're you're familiar, right? Yeah. With, with how it goes. Two and a half years in. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it, it's it's complex a little bit to explain, but the. The bottom line is that you're using bilateral stimulation, which uh, originally was about um, eye movements. Mm. And it still is. It still can be. Uh, at least it was discovered as a methodology by by understanding that when, when our eyes are flickering back and forth, um, there's a sense of relief. There's a sense of calm that happens. Mm. And also when they're flickering back and forth quickly, you can access aspects of the brain for processing that you might not easily be able to get to otherwise. I always describe it for people like when you're dreaming and your eyes are going dun, 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 yeah. Dun, back and forth. Yeah, like what I would say there is that um, our, our brains are amazing, beautifully made, and and designed for healing. We're, we're designed to process out material. And so various things happen to us during the day, sometimes stressful, sometimes disturbing, sometimes wonderful, whatever. At night when we're in a deep sleep, in our REM sleep, um, and you know, you notice, yeah, somebody's got their eyes closed, they're sleeping, and you can see their eyes flickering. That the brain is naturally processing memories. Mm. The brain is naturally processing everything that's happened throughout the day. Well, if you wake up in the middle of that, startled because it's a you know a nightmare, what have you, it means the brain couldn't process it. Mm. It means something was in the way. Mm. And and I, I always liken it to like shrapnel in, in your leg. <laughs> if you if you had shrapnel stuck in your leg your body would naturally want to heal your leg and it would send whatever it needs to to like do the healing process. But with the shrapnel there, it's not, it's going to be healing around it. You know, unless that shrapnel is removed, the healing can't be fully accomplished. And so uh, when you're, when you can't, pro- when your brain can't process something, something so disturbing or whatnot, um, EMDR is like opening it up so that you access that while you're conscious and you're like removing that shrapnel so the brain can do the work um, and, and heal. And so um, there's a, the great thing about EMDR is that it's like kind of a protocol-based mm-hmm. method. So as a therapist, you learn how to do it. And you're really following almost a script <laughs> yeah. um, because, you know, sometimes you have to go off script for various reasons for various times. But, but it just works very effectively when you work through the whole process. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so the the whole way through, you you start off with first just you know you have to have a rapport with whoever you're working with. You develop that. You understand their history. You understand kind of like what are the traumas. What are what are you probably going to be working with? But then there's there's a whole level of kind of getting resources. Like st- there might be strengthening, um, helping a person 
um, learn how to kind of on their own get to a calm place mm -hmm. or learning, you know, what are resources that they might have, spiritual resources or emotional resources. So you, you do a little prep. But then when you actually get to the, the part where you're processing, um, the first element is about um, uh, having to be able to come re recall the memory and then be less triggered by it. If, even if right now I asked you, like, think of something horrifying that happened in the last, I don't know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like for most people, if they actually do sit and think about it, they will feel something in their body. Like they'll just feel something mm -hmm. in their chest or maybe they'll tighten their muscles or something. They'll have a sense of activation, and uh, which means it isn't fully processed, mm -hmm. right? If it's something that is in the past uh, as opposed to something that's happening right now. And so what you're doing is, is in the EMDR, the, it's eye movement, but then the D is desensitization. So you're helping the person get desensitized so they can remember something that was painful, difficult, shameful, fearful, whatever, and they aren't activated. So you bring down the activation and it's powerful. And you recall like the therapist mm -hmm. will ask you on a scale of you know, zero to 10, uh, most disturbing you can imagine is a 10. Uh, zero is no disturbance at all. How disturbing is this memory? And so what you're eventually getting to is to a place where it's not disturbing or very, very. very yeah. Okay. I, I get stuck at three or four. I, I, I can't okay. get past that okay. point. But You know, yeah. Life magazines and how they would have like this incredible photo, you know, journal of like wars. And if I'm looking at a magazine of a war, which I have no connection to, I can look at it and just take it for what it is based on the pictures. Right. I have a trauma in my life of abuse at the age of, I guess, eight. I, I feel like I can look at it as if it was a, a picture in that magazine and it's completely, I feel nothing. I'm, I must be at a zero and I have been for years. Um, right probably because of therapy that I had to approach years ago to look at it. And, uh, but if, if it wasn't for that therapy, it would probably still be haunting in my marriage and creeping up into the, the intimacy that a marriage needs to, <laughs> to thrive and be holy. And I noticed that that was that shrapnel and I didn't know it was there. Um, so it very slowly had to be retracted out <laughs> and then it was, and then it worked. I mean, like I can, I can recall the memory and I was like, yeah, there it is. I, it's like a picture in my brain of almost somebody else. So there's a complete di uh, disconnection now, but I know it was me, but right. it doesn't hurt at all. And, and in that case, if you were coming in for therapy for mm -hmm. something else, like I wouldn't work on that because it's already, if it's already, it's not activating you, it's right. not needing to be processed. So that's, mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's great. Um, the next stage though, after the, the desensitization is the reprocessing. And so for a lot of times, even if there isn't the level of activation, um, there's a sense in which um, you hold beliefs. They may not be mm -hmm. cognitive beliefs that, like, if I asked you, are you lovable? You might say, yeah, of course, I know I'm lovable. Mm -hmm. But if deep down in your heart, there's a sense in which, uh, no, if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me kind of thing. And, and the same goes with God. Like, you know, cognitively, I know God loves me, but deep down, I might be, like, fearful that God would actually, like, destroy me <laughs> uh, for, for almost anything, right? And so we're kind of getting at deep down, what are those beliefs in our heart? And so if it, once we act, we access or kind of understand those beliefs, which we find out at the beginning of the processing, kind of what some of those are, then after you do the desensitization, you check in with, okay, that belief that you said that I'm not lovable or I'm not worthy or something like that, um, is that still true? How true does that feel mm -hmm. to you? And you actually are, um, well, you actually establish what is a belief that you would prefer to believe whether you feel it yet or not. <laughs> and then you actually track that after the deprocessing. Do you now believe, oh, you know, that that terrible thing that happened wasn't my fault. I was worthy of love, even mm -hmm. though that person didn't love me that time, mm -hmm. right? So that becomes the new belief. And so, um, and then you kind of go through and see whether that really is true in your heart of hearts. And so if, if you ask the question, you know, on a scale of zero to seven, how true does this feel to you mm -hmm. that you're lovable and worthy, let's say, and, and if a person says seven, it means it's fully, you know, it's, it feels 100% true. And you check that a little. But if it's truly a seven, then you're good. If it's not, though, like if it's a five <laughs> or mm -hmm. two even, like then means there's something else. We got we to gotta process some more. 
and so on. But it has you, to process more, not reprocess at that point. I mean, you don't. At what point do you start doing the reprocessing of trying to well, figure out? You know, that, no, that's still yeah, it's still it's reprocessing in okay. a sense. Possibly, it depends. It, yeah. it could it could be a new a bit of new material that wasn't processed in the main part of it, yeah. and something that's still left there. Um, and the way I like to explain it, it's like um, this whole process of all these stages is like you're you're cleaning your house. And even if it looks clean, let's just check under that couch. <laughs> let's just look over here in case there's something we can't see, but it's there. And we just want to make sure it's all really good. Yeah. And so sometimes after you've done, you know, the desensitization and some processing, there's still something there. And you might recall at the, after even you get to a seven, uh, yeah, I fully believe that I am worthy of love, let's say, um, then there's a body scan. Yeah. And you do like let's check the body and 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 from the top to the bottom. You're talking about like looking for like like the tightness in the chest or yes. the feelings in the face or whatever it might be. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so if there's nothing, then that's great. You know, that's that's pretty much the end of that. But if sometimes even though the, all the processing seem great, oh, there's something I'm still feeling. We want it. We don't want to ignore that. We go yeah. right. We you know we work on that. I remember in the uh, first few weeks of going through EMDR. So again, this was over two years ago now for me. That it always amazed me, and while well, I know it's not like a dream, but the way that the, the brain will bring up completely, um, seemingly non-related things, right? So like, and I always, there was a comedian I remember years ago, um, he had a, a routine where he was talking about dreams, and he said, dreams are the weirdest thing. It's like, you know, I'm falling down a mine shaft, and then boom, I'm in a parade. You know, it's like how fast it could switch. Right. And that's how it sometimes felt with me and EMDR, that I'd start, focus on that, that painful traumatic memory and then suddenly something completely seemingly unrelated would come up right. i remember thinking about one of the worst things that ever happened to me and it was you know sexual childhood abuse from from some neighbors and then suddenly i'm thinking about a fantastic memory of seeing the val kilmer movie top secret with some of my friends right after i moved to a town that i loved and there was and so trying to unpack well why did why did the brain go in that direction and, and it just has been a fascinating journey of going to that movie with those friends was a memory that I hadn't thought of since it happened. And and the fact that my brain was keeping it back there, almost like a, this is a good thing. This was a good moment that you do have good moments that you do have good memories and slowly seeing the scales tipping in my brain from always focused on tra the traumatic things, always having that as the weight all my decisions revolving around the traumas, all my decisions revolving around needing to protect mm. to slowly getting to a point where now in my 50s, I'm going, okay, I almost like I have to start a new life now because that trauma doesn't matter. How And then learning the reprocessing, how do I learn to, to live? I really appreciated it in, in your book. And let's, let's start talking about litanies of the heart. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I, I want to get to kind of the the parts based um, approach you take, but I want to jump to the first chapter where you share your own origin of of um, trauma. But it was really an acceptance from your dad. You share a story about hockey and starting to play hockey, and that story. While I my my story is not one for one, it really resonated with me because you also talked about how your own relationship with your father impacted your relationship with God the Father. And that's a commonality that I didn't know you and I had. I, I've struggled for a long time of just my relationship with God the Father and how those kind of... So talk, talk a little bit about... Share a little bit of your own story, if you would. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to. And all the, the vignettes in the stories are actually composite stories, so yeah. they're no one person. <laughs> but... Um, but basically, yeah, no, I definitely drew some from my own experience. So was the, ho the hockey kid wasn't you then? It, there's a comp it's a composite. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought it was a one to I, I know that you said it was a composite, but I I thought when I read that, I was like, oh, I didn't know that Jerry. Okay. <laughs> but, but well, then never mind. You know, we're done. Then. <laughs> like, You're okay. Um, you know, I definitely, yeah, the uh, experience of trauma that I experienced as a child is really also one of the things that moved me from working as a school counselor and maybe just doing general kind of counseling to being someone who specializes in trauma. And so um, working with trauma is like a passion of mine. And, and it came about because I had to work through my own, mm. my own trauma, my own stuff. And so, yeah, definitely um, the, that uh, my father was abusive and how 
um, that made it really difficult for me to have a relationship with God the Father is kind of a huge part of my story. And so uh, I certainly relate to that. Um, and even the healing that I experienced in terms of processing memories, and this would have been way back when I was in college, profoundly affected the way that I now see healing and working with people and how we can bring a spiritual element in and how, in fact, I think it's essential uh, or at least something I wouldn't want to do without. Yeah. Well, one thing I was curious, you mentioned your dad. Is your dad alive or? Uh, he's not. Oh, he's, he's not. not. Okay. Yeah. And so that's interesting too, because that means your healing can get to a point because he's not in the picture necessarily. So is it, do you feel safer because he's not in the picture anymore? Um, it's a great question. Um, I thought that uh, I would. I would. I thought I did all the work that I needed to do mm -hmm. uh, before he died. And I, I haven't. I, I don't have a relation. I didn't have a relationship with him for twenty years before okay. he died. So okay. he wasn't really a part of my life that I had to worry about. But um, I thought I did all the work. And then when I found out he died. I had a whole other period of time of processing that I had to work through that was a lot more difficult than I was expecting it to be. My wife actually predicted it. Because, really? <laughs> of course, your wife knows yeah, you yeah. better than anybody. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I was like, no, I'm fine. You know, whatever. If he dies, he dies. <laughs> <laughs> Which, but that's know. a very real feeling. And I know you're not alone in that um, because, you know, I've I both of my parents are gone. My mm -hmm. mom. She, we're coming up on a one-year anniversary of her death in a, just a couple of days. So December 6th is is a one-year anniversary for me. And I am going to be looking at that and mm. feeling and allowing the feelings to just come as they come. And right. I'm not going to force it. And whatever it is, I'm going to look at it, but I'm going to feel it. I'm not going to try to repress anything because I, I don't think that's really helpful for me. Um, but it does bring many questions to the surface about like how I see myself, how I, I instantly want to judge myself. Like, was I a good daughter? Did I live up to what I was supposed to? And now the relationship has come to a definite not end. I mean, like, cause we know we're Catholic, we believe in everlasting life, you know, so I know her, it's not like she's gone. She's just in a different place, you know, and I could still pray. Uh, so that's comforting too. Um, but anyway, it does, bring interesting questions that I that I also have to work on. And I think there's a lot of uh, people in our audience who also are in that same boat. So um, I'm very thankful that you shared that one little line. You went 20 years while he was alive and didn't have a relationship with him. I find that very, very interesting because I think there are lots of people who are in a, the very same boat. They are at, they're in their 20 years. They don't know the end number because their parents are still alive, but there is a disconnect Nevertheless, so do you ever do you address that in your book? Um, the idea of the separation, separation. while you're alive. Um, I don't know that it comes up in particular in okay. the book. I mean, I think as a marriage and family therapist, we mm -hmm. we call that an emotional cutoff, right? If there's mm -hmm. for some reason, you know, you no no longer in contact with somebody in your in your family. In this case, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't even a choice of mine, so it wasn't mm -hmm. like I did a cutoff kind of a thing. Uh, but um, it's just it's a long story. <laughs> but uh, but but I know that um, when when there is that kind of cutoff and it does a lot of damage, though, regardless of whether on some level you're like, oh, I'm glad not to have that person in my life or something. Um, it does. It's it's very painful because even if, say, in this case, it's my father, um, even though I may have um, not wanted him as a father, I have a sense of wanting a father and why isn't this father loving me more or mm -hmm. why isn't this father more heroic or why, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or why, you know, it's just, a, it, it highlights a loss of fatherhood. And I think, I think people relate to that a lot, whether or not it's, it's the story is as kind of extreme as mine, but mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we're just disconnected from somebody who's important to us. And I think that as men, especially, um, you kind of need that affirmation from your father, like even if you have issues with him or whatnot, like it's it's a powerful thing to know your father's proud of you or that your father sees you and understands you, loves you, and this kind of thing. So it creates an attachment wound, mm. uh, actually, which is might be a segue to the litany's prayers, but yeah. Yeah. because they're really based on attachment. Well, let's talk about the parts, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So, so what is yeah. what is parts based therapy? Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
the most popular type of parts-based therapy right now is internal family systems, so or IFS, as it's sometimes called, um, and, and it's super popular. And even you know, therapists trying to get trained have a hard time getting into trainings. Like it's 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 very hot right now, and uh, because it's really really effective. Um, there, are, there are other parts-based approaches. Like I, I did a lot of training in ego state therapy, which is a, again another parts-based therapy that existed even before IFS. But it goes back all the way to like 1920s and 30s mm. uh, and this kind of thing. And so what it is essentially is the notion that our we don't have like a consistent unified personality. Sometimes we just think we're one thing. You use the word monolith. Mono, yeah, we're not a monolithic kind mm. of personality. In fact, I mean, if you only saw me as a therapist, then you might think, oh, that's who Jerry is. Like, that's Jerry. He's this hopefully kind and mm -hmm. loving and, and accepting, you know, helpful therapist. Um, but if you saw me, then you got to see me at home or with friends or you got to see me in some other context, you might see different aspects of me. Mm -hmm. And so we have different parts within us, different, we might say we call them aspects of self or um, parts of self, or we could say... Um, you know, sub personalities even, mm -hmm. and to what extent are they individual? <laughs> it's a little bit tricky. I think phenomenologically, like in a in a in a felt sense, they feel separate when, when mm -hmm. you get to know them. Like they have their own thoughts and feelings, hold on to memories, uh, have a perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, once you get to know your parts, and you use the example like you might have the the, the part of you that just wants to binge watch Netflix and and yes. you know read the news. And then you have the part that is the manager that knows how to get the business side of things done. And then you have, the, you know, so, and I found that kind of an interesting way of looking at it because I think I sometimes get, um, I sometimes worry about how I'm different in different situations. And you're, you pointed out at the very beginning that that's how we're built, that we will be kind of like these different entities in different situations. I mean, uh, we, we got, you know, Ben Barron, our editor, sitting there on the floor, and I know that there's Ben Barron who I will hang out with on a family setting. But then I think I sometimes worry about when he sees Greg Willits, the the business person, who I start itemizing bullet things. I'm going, man, it's just I feel like a jerk right now when I'm talking. You know, it's like there's this different personality, but it's all unified and it's all it's all part in that. And I and I found that a really interesting. A way of of addressing that and giving that example. Yeah, yeah, and because I think that we're not truly consistent in terms of how we present throughout life. We might pretend to be, but we're yeah. just not. And in fact, it's functional. Yeah, it's not wrong. <laughs> it's not wrong. You're not broken because you do that. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it's a diversity and a richness of resources we have within us. Yeah. And the the thing is, we may have parts that are carrying some kind of wound. And especially we, we were talking a moment ago about, you know, childhood wounds or abuse and things like that. So when a trauma happens, you know, so if, if it's like a sexual abuse situation or a emotional abuse of situation, any kind of thing like that, and, and say like we're eight years old, let's say, when it happens. Well, there's a sense in which the part of us that is holding that memory stays eight years old in some way. And that that part that might be carrying uh, some fear or shame or pain of some kind, right? Um, that part, the system kind of organizes to kind of keep that part away so that you can function. Because if you are 24-7 filled with fear and shame and, and sadness or whatnot, it, it'll be overwhelming, Right. And so when you're eight years old, <laughs> our brains are amazing. Again, mm -hmm. we have a way of compartmentalizing that. And, and, and that part kind of gets exiled. They even call mm -hmm. that an exile part. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's sort of a little bit out of mostly out of consciousness, but it's there. And so when something happens later in life where we're triggered by something or reminded of something or something happens that that is, you know, painful, difficult, sad, you know, whatever. Sometimes what happens is that wounded child part that was exiled away suddenly becomes present mm -hmm. and maybe even uh, possibly kind of, I don't want to say takes over the system, but mm -hmm. basically has um, a, a greater presence in the system. We call that blending or unblending. So the, 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 any given part that kind of is running the ship, 
driving the bus, mm -hmm. <laughs> then that part is it, we're going to present really differently than we would normally present when that happens. And so that's where somebody says, what's wrong with him? Like he's he's depressed or he's he's angry all the time or he's something's different. And that's usually because there's a part that is carrying some kind of burden and it's and it's now like been kind of exposed or, or whatnot. But speaking of exiles and these mm -hmm. exile parts carrying wounds, we also have other parts of the system that are they're really well, really good at protecting them, right? So if that was to happen, if we were to get a trigger, right? Mm -hmm. And so suddenly the exile is kind of exposed and we're feeling those feelings we didn't, we're, we've been trying for 30 years or 40 years, whatever it is to not feel, then we have other parts, other kinds of protector parts that show up and they uh, prevent those feelings. This so is what you call the firefighter and the manager? That's the firefighters, yeah. yeah. Usually it's firefighters. Yeah. It could be a manager, but once it gets overwhelming, it's... And that could be, you know, consuming alcohol or drugs or binge watching TV or or even workaholism. It could be anything that is that that basically kicks into gear to make sure that we don't feel that pain. Hmm. Wow! So, so you, many thoughts. You talked you talked about <laughs> what's the acronym IFS? Yes. yes. And yeah. so that's what's super popular. And and now someone might be watching. Go wait a minute, wait a minute. There's there. You point out that there's some association with that that could seem contrary to Catholicism. Yes. Could you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. That's one of the many reasons I actually wrote this book. Okay. <laughs> because I was one, I loved IFS. Wow. So my gosh, so effective or just parts approaches and so powerful, so effective. I uh, couldn't even believe it. Like even some clients I've been working with for years, like I was seeing a difference in like a couple of weeks. No. Yeah. Right. And I was like, wow, I haven't had this kind of change since e I started doing EMDR. Well, but. There were aspects of the model, <laughs> aspects that, you know, taught by the founder of this model that that was just disturbing to me and that didn't didn't seem consistent with the faith or that were open questions that were a little bit hard for me to make sense of with my faith. And I wanted answers. So I kind of went into a deep dive of like exploring it and figuring it out and, you know, and, and which led to a lot of what's in the book where I do a whole sorry scripture study you know, where I'm analyzing, are, are parts, do they exist in the Bible? Are they yeah. in some way, maybe they're not talked about the way that IFS is the language of IFS per se, but is it there in some way? Is it in the story of the stories of the saints? Are they, you know, is it in Aquinas, Augustine, and all these people like, um, and, and is it something I need to draw out or is it absent? Mm -hmm. You know, is it something I need to to be concerned about? Because the the approach of IFS, like the founder and, and a little bit the movement itself, has kind of moved into what I would consider a more new age kind of way. I mean, they would say you, you could, you don't have to be, but it's there. <laughs> if you go to any of the, if you're a therapist, you have to go to the trainings or whatnot, you're hearing a lot of spirituality that is, in my mind, not consistent with the faith. So I set out to prove and show how it is consistent and how it can be properly integrated mm. uh, for use with any Christians in general, really. Mm. With, with parts-based you know, going back to the idea of the exiles, uh, you know, w with your book in particular, and you you point out a few times, like this book is not meant to be a replacement for for therapy, right? But for someone who wants to start going down the path of of are there exiled parts that I need to be paying attention to? How does your book help someone identify what those things are, right. and then what next healthy steps might be, and how does the book? You know, assist in that journey of trying to figure that out, and, and, and I'm assuming all in tandem with some some level of therapy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think ideally for most people, I would recommend therapy yeah. for most people, um, and that this would be a you know great adjunct to to that therapy, especially if they're doing if they're with a therapist who's using parts work. Um, so, but the book itself, um, I would say um, it's organized on all the different chapters um, conceptually to work through the different aspects of parts work and in terms of understanding what is the inmost self and then what is what are parts and what is blending and unblending mm -hmm. and what is burdening and unburdening so i'm walking through all those different steps throughout the book and in each chapter there's uh, um well there's that vignette a little little snip, snippet of a story to kind of help you know have a sense of the the narrative or the reality of it there's an element where I discuss the psychology behind it. And then there's a scripture study that sort of shows how it's consistent with the Bible. 
And then there's a meditation or prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is where um, the, the different meditations are designed to help you, you know, find your parts, uh, discover, uh, do a little bit of unblending if you can, uh, discover different kinds like manager parts and firefighter parts. And eventually in the book, like how do you, how can you identify an exiled part mm -hmm. and what does unburdening look like? And so I'm kind of walking that, you know, you through that process. And so those exercises are really important uh, element of it. Because if you just read about it, it might stay in your cognitive in your head, right? Mm -hmm. And hey, this all might sound really fascinating. And for many people, they'll just enjoy that. But if you actually want to experience this, you got to experience it. <laughs> well, yeah. who in the Bible did you find that sort of gave some evidence to you that, okay, I see that there are some parts being sort of revealed in the scripture. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so I'd love to talk about that. That's great. Um, I would say I saw it all over. Once you have the eyes to see it, it's mm -hmm. everywhere. Oh, wow. That's encouraging. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and to be honest, I'll, I'll backtrack just a bit. Well, it, it relates to the Bible because it's a transfiguration, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I named my practice transfiguration. I, have a, I attend a, a Byzantine Catholic church. I I, I love icons mm -hmm. and I'm devoted, you know, the transfiguration is, is obviously it's a Catholic devotion, but it's mm -hmm. a strong devotion in the East. And so I was thinking about all this part stuff and I'm in my, my prayer room at home and I have a large icon of the transfiguration uh, as my focal point. And I was looking at it and I was going, oh, you know, what's interesting is that this icon, it shows Jesus uh, it has, um, you know, Moses and uh, um, Elijah. El thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then the three apostles. Yeah. It'd be terrible if I couldn't remember who was in the icon <laughs> at this point. Look at it every day. And he's and, giving this really in yeah. depth description of the transfiguration. <laughs> My whole life revolves around right. the transfiguration. There were these I can't name the people. Three guys. Oh, and there are three other guys. <laughs> so there and, was like uh, God, a priest. <laughs> you know, yeah. okay. <laughs> and they walked into a bar. Right. And, uh, <laughs> But I was looking at it, and I was thinking, um, Christ in this icon represents the inmost self, the core, the center of your heart, mm -hmm. and uh, where the Holy Spirit dwells, mm -hmm. <laughs> where God is. And, you know, you have Moses representing the law, and you have, you know, the Ten Commandments and everything. You have Elijah representing the prophets. So there's sort of different aspects of each person, you know. And then there you have the three apostles, right? You have Peter, who's got, you know, who's so impetuous. And so, you know, you've got James and John and they were, you know, the sons of thunder or whatever. So they were, they had a lot of energy and excitement. Of course, we know John becomes, a, you know, more and more into the role of the beloved disciple and all that. So there's a distinction there. So all I was seeing those, these characters in this icon were all different parts. And so the icon kind of represents something of um, something that is also within us. Mm -hmm. And it led me to um, all kinds of exploration, you know, looking at St. Paul and talking about the body of Christ and having different parts of the body of Christ. And even though they're all different, they're all important. And, uh, you know, and Christ is the head and, and you know, all these different parts. So that was interesting to me. Um, I, I deep dived into St. Maximus, the confessor. I don't know how familiar you are no, with No, not at all. Mm -mm. Love him. If I <laughs> was being confirmed tomorrow, my confirmation name would now be. Maximus. Ooh, share him, I love please. Yes. Let's know more. <laughs> yeah, he's a. Like, well, it's just a cool sounding name. I mean, who isn't cares, it? Who, who cares who he was <laughs> no, or what yeah, he did? Yeah, yeah. But just like, what's your confirmation name? Maximus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's perfect. I mean, just quickly. I mean, I think seventh century. Uh, mm -hmm. He was originally like from the east, like in Constantinople and mid Middle East, and he was a very learned, but also uh, a, a monk. Uh, and he traveled a bit, and he made it to Rome at one point, and he fought against uh, uh, heresy uh, related to the wills of the two wills of Christ, and 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 uh, so he actually is called the Confessor because he was um, he refused to back down in the court of Constantinople, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and he he upheld the truth mm -hmm. and, and didn't fall into heresy, and they cut out his tongue uh, mm -hmm. for that, and I think they cut off his hand or something. And so, you know, and he was like 80 or something at the time. So he was an older man. And he, he didn't, he died some point after. He survived for a bit. But anyway, so he's a, he's a sense of martyr for the faith. Mm -hmm. He's intelligent and all this, but he's written all this stuff. And what he's written is so fascinating is that he talks about Christ as the center of the universe and how on some level 
the kingdom of God is represented in an entire universe mm. or multiverse, maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But but it would be like, you know, and that and that that's the macrocosm is like Christ at the center of the universe. Mm-hmm. And as the kingdom of God grows, the entire universe uh, is worshiping God and is like this kingdom. And then he does something super cool. And he says that macrocosm in the universe is present within you, within each of us. So this idea of the kingdom within is that Christ is at the center of our soul, right? Our, you know, Holy Spirit is present. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And and that that universe and and everything is is in us in a, in a sense. So he's very, you know, I know he's very metaphysical and all that in wow. his thinking. But to me, it was really profound and it spoke to me, oh, okay. So on some level, we're worshiping, you know, like when we go to church, we're worshiping all together with, with, with others and worshiping, but in a sense, even within us, all our parts and led by our core inmost self is worshiping also. So there's it's happening on multiple levels. Mm. And to me, that was just cool and profound. Wow. You started to give an outline of, of sort of how the chapters and the process are for someone, if they're going to pick up the book, they're going to go through this. What can someone expect to actually um, do with the book? What can they expect to happen in their lives if they are wanting to do this independent of going to a therapist? Could someone pick right. this up and then and for, bring in the litanies and that kind of thing? What, what right. does that look like for someone to use this as a workbook in their lives? And, and what kind of transformation or transfiguration could you ex- <laughs> could someone expect in their lives as they're going through this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would think um, that, for one thing, um, getting in touch with your parts is life-changing. And so even if you're doing it just a little bit, you, you'll notice a difference almost right away. Mm. Um, and because I also talk about this in most self, this core, this heart, if you will. And, uh, and I did a lot of study to understand that. It took me a long time because there's the Old Testament use of the word heart and there's the New Testament. It's sort of different with the Greek. There's the, in the, in the history of the church, sometimes the self or the heart or at least the soul. I mean, they get used in different ways. So it's pretty complex. But bottom line, we have the core spiritual center, and um, you maybe call it the cave of the heart or the mirror. Saint Athanasius calls it the mirror of this of, of the soul, and, and that reflects the image of God. And so that once you get in touch with that, and and that part that I wouldn't even say it's a part of you. That center of you is is present, is is fully more fully present. Um, you're naturally you're just more compassionate more calm, more understanding, more patient, more, um, you know, uh, you're, you're not about, you're not stressed. You're not about having some agenda. You're just really ultimately reflecting God's love mm. by and large. Mm. And so once you're accessing that and you're relating from that place to your various parts, then you start to love your parts. And I think this is, it really gets to this notion of loving the self properly. And St. Thomas Aquinas talks about self-friendship, like what does it mean to be a friend to the self, which is kind of an interesting concept. If you're a monolith inside, mm-hmm. how do you a friend to yourself? If the, and uh, St. Thomas talks about friendship in terms of union, ultimately. Mm-hmm. And so you, how do you be have a union with yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, we have the commandment to love God and others as, as we love ourselves. What does it mean to love ourselves? So... I think that loving ourselves this way is profound. Yeah. And so if you have a part, like let's say it's uh, a part that that is um, really critical. We all have a critical part, right? Mm-hmm. Don't we? Mm-hmm. I have yet to meet anybody that didn't right. have that critical yeah. voice. It usually comes from some critical parent or something. But it's, it's really negative and critical. And, and we might have a tendency to be like, you know, let's be positive and like just let's just not be critical. And uh, fine. But the reality is when you do that, you're pushing away a part of you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and so I really invite people to do the opposite. If you have a part that is critical, or you had a part that is struggling with you know some addiction, or even a part that is overworking or something, bring it closer. Get to know that part. I you you, you can relate to that part, and you under, and you get to start to understand when you're able to get to that spiritual center place, and you can relate to the part and be like, what is that part's actual intention? So if the critic is constantly putting me down, 
right? This voice in my head is basically saying, you're, you suck, or that was mm -hmm. bad, or mm -hmm. whatever, all the time. And you actually spend a bit of time with that part, you'll discover that the part thinks it has to criticize you to protect you. Mm. It's that exile <laughs> firefighter. Yes. Because it could be an exiled part coming up to the forefront that didn't know how to react properly or whatever. And by getting to know that part, and right. you talk about this a little bit, and correct me if I'm going down the wrong path here, but but you talk a little bit about like, it makes me think about parenting the wounded inner child type thing. Exactly. You, you bring up the whole idea of this kid was wounded and basically was taught to have to, you know, shut up and self-preserve. Yes. And then later on in life when that, that wounded exiled part starts coming up to the forefront and that's the critical part, well, getting to know that person, loving that little kid um, can make a huge difference on how that critical part starts to become a little bit more objective in the criticism and criticize when criticism is needed. Right. But if you don't address the protector part that's critical and you just go try to go right to the child part, which is always a temptation, which yeah, a therapist okay. is yeah. likely to do, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, just in basic inner child work, um, you're going to bypass that protector. It won't yeah. like it because it thinks and believes that unless it puts that kid in his place, you know, and teaches them a lesson or puts them down, that something bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was learned a long time ago, yep. unfortunately. And in some way, um, sometimes when you're a kid, shut up and just accept it that you're bad is the only way to survive, unfortunately. Or shut up and accept it. This is the way it's going to happen. It doesn't yes. have to be that you're bad. It's just like you, you don't get to call any of the shots. Right. Right. And that was uh, might have been what was necessary or, or the only option when you're eight. But it's not the only option now that you're an adult, right. and yet your parts don't know that. And they're still operating as if in a survival level. So if you simply bypass it and just say, oh, critic, shut up, you know, you're, you're not positive or you're not holy or something, then um, that, that part is, is going to, it'll be a backlash. Even if you do some work and you actually do relate in some way to that wounded child, um, the, the critic will show up later. So you'll do all this work and you'll think, oh, I feel so much better and bang. And what will that look like? I mean, if the critic shows up later in that case. It... Yeah, it, it'll be like a relapse. <clears throat> no, be, no, yeah, really. A relapse or, uh, or, or, or yeah, or just a, 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 maybe a, a, you feel good for a couple of days and then a depression right. or something like that. So, but the, but the beauty of this is that there's so much hope here because once you discover that this part has been cr like, who knows for how long, like sometimes decades, right, yeah. has been critical – nonstop with the mindset that this is the only way we're going to survive. Mm -hmm. And if you pause and you connect with that part and you're able to say, I get you, I understand. I don't like it. It's, it, you know, some kind of affirmation something has to change. Yeah. You've been working overtime to protect the system thanklessly. And it might be hard for the part to hear though, that it's actually been counterproductive in the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you can say, I get it, though, I understand why you're doing this and you relate and you connect and the, the part feels a little bit suddenly like some I feel somewhat understood. Right. I'm not just a bad part of the system. And you say, would it be OK for me to show you maybe a new way to do it? That would mean you wouldn't have to be so critical and you would be happier and we would be able to this child we will make sure is going to not be overwhelmed. So how does the book help someone do that? exercise to do that part yeah well there are there are different exercises in that those the ones i'm talking about come a little later in the book because mm -hmm. that's a little bit more advanced mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh and so toward the end there's uh the chapter on exiles and there's an activity about connecting with an exile and and i would say and you could have multiple exiles couldn't you oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. Oh, most of us yeah. yeah we have a whole orphanage of yeah, wounded yeah. children some of us yeah. <laughs> oh, <no. It's> like... <laughs> uh, connect with your inner orphanage no, and sometimes it's 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 one or two, but the beauty of it is when you, when you do get that protector on board, and and realizing and and that its old role of being critic is no longer needed, but it can have a new role in the system. Like maybe it's a role of a coach or encourager or something like this, and then you and then you we, you connect with that exile that child part, and and you do the work that you do with that to help it. You know, those parts are beautiful. And those little wounded children, they, they're like, you see things, you discover a, a side of yourself that can bring joy 
and playfulness. And it's just, it's wonderful to see. Okay. I'm going to turn the spotlight more on you because yeah. you have been down this road and you are operating now and I guess a more integrated, is that the word? The perfect word. Yeah. Okay. Um, with all your many parts. So is the eight-year-old still with you in your orphanage? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what language to use, but is that part healed and healthy and alive? Or does is the goal to have the eight-year-old sort of fade away in its proper place and just be a memory? Hmm. Yeah, so I would say no, that it's the goal is not that it fades away or disappears or, or anything like that. Okay. I, I would say that all of our parts are... Um, are, are, are part of us. Okay. And so they're, um, you know, worthy of love and respect. They're not, an, they don't have like an ontological reality of their own. Like they're not a separate being or anything. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they may be, um, but, but they, they're all kind of important and the parts don't just disappear and, and show up like out of nowhere. So, uh, I, I don't know whether we're born with 10 parts or mm -hmm. what happens. I don't really know that. I I think that's an, an open question to figure out. It seems like they're being created in it, it our life. It seems <laughs> like that. It seems like that. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that they, they are so much created as we gain awareness of them. Like when you're three, you don't, you don't have any awareness, I don't think, of your parts, right, or any sense of that. You don't have a lot of consciousness in the way that you do as an adult, even mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. remembering things. Mm -hmm. But when you're older, you, you start to. And so I would say more that – the parts start taking on roles where maybe they were just sort of quiet or in the background or whatever. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but they start taking on roles uh, throughout life. And so you have the earlier roles, you know, can be ones that are, that are around trauma. But you could also have roles that are around positive things mm -hmm. too, right, and resourcefulness and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, so, the, so as you grow, I think these parts sort of take on roles. Mm -hmm. And so the idea would be that in terms of integration and healing, would be that uh, at, at the end of the day, your parts are no longer carrying burdens, like heavy burdens, mm -hmm. that your parts are, uh, I, mean, I would never say like perfectly healed. Are we ever perfectly healed in right. this world? Like, right. I think not till That's next. heaven, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> but but reasonably like your part is, is not carrying some crazy burden and that your parts are interacting with each other because our parts interact with each other. And they're interacting each other now led by this inmost self and in a way that's harmonious and that's functional and that there's a sense in which your whole inner world is like, you know, like a, like a church where everybody's singing perfectly together in harmony and worshiping a loving God. Like, can you imagine? And it's like your whole inner system is that. And I think when you have that kind of self-love and this kind of inner harmony, then you really are capable of loving others and even God in a way like like never before, maybe the way we're meant to. Wow. Yeah, every once in a while when, when we're talking about these things, <clears throat> I'll, I'll admit, <clears throat> excuse me, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking a part of me <laughs> really? is Which just part? wanting to say, this sounds really fluffy and I don't <laughs> like it. Yeah. It seems like I... You know, it's it's like this is going to be too touchy feely, and I don't like it. And another part makes it feel like this makes a lot of sense. And so I'm thinking from the perspective of someone who's listening, who's already going, I'm I'm uncomfortable because this doesn't sound Catholic. I'm uncomfortable because this doesn't sound like, um, it sounds New Agey, right? And and we're just kind of if if we're trying to take our faith seriously, we should rightfully have radars going saying, I don't want to fall into new agey things even by accident. Right. So there's a certain level of trust that we have to throw into this. Number one, I know you, so I trust you. Number two, the fact that your book is published with Sophia, that says a lot, I think, because they're not going to publish something that is is going to be, you know, heretical <laughs> and, or, or well, it yeah. might be a little fluffy. I yeah. mean, there is a fluffiness to it, right? It's like we're having to get in touch with our heart and by... The fact that Jesus uh, has an intimacy with heart, the sacred heart, and the immaculate heart of Mary, there's a, a softness there, right? They're, they're, it's not a hardening of heart, but a softening. Mm -hmm. And so for someone who has had to put up barriers, which are hard, to learn how to become soft, it can be a difficult thing. And so I I, I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to throw out for the people that are, feel the hardness when they hear the topic like this, which is very soft, 
Mm. That how do we offer a, a ongoing encouragement to them that am I already be wanting to shut off and not want to be open to this? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, what you're saying, you know, was really hitting me a, a few years ago and, and I was really thinking, you know, in terms of IFS and Dick Schwartz, who's the founder of it. And he's, he wrote a book called no bad parts. And I would you really, do a critique of that in the book? I have a whole appendix where I critique yeah. it yeah. because I really did not like that book. His, the, the book that he had like, Back in the 90s, there was just like an internal family system, basically kind of like textbook. I thought it was very well done, you know. So he has like kind of like what I would call the foundational book if you would just want to want to learn about IFS. But then he's been doing other things since, especially No Bad Parts, that I was really uncomfortable with because he basically sees the self. I purposely say in most self. I don't capitalize the S. Mm-hmm. Kind of on purpose. Mm-hmm. He capitalizes S when he talks about the self. And it has those qualities that he discovered. And he's not even Christian, right? And in in the work he did, he identified that when you connect with the self, that it has these qualities, these eight Cs, compassion and calm and and creativity and these different things. And that it naturally comes from like anybody, no matter how traumatized their lives were or messed up they are, when you help them connect with their self, those qualities are there. That's interesting to me. But he takes it to a point where he believes that that self is like part of a larger self, and then he capitalizes all the letters, S-E-L-F. Mm. Mm. He doesn't call it God. Mm. It mm. could be God, maybe. You could see it that way. But but he would see it as there's this larger self in the greater universe, that everything has a self, like the planet has a self, and da-da-da-da. Mm. And, and that we're all just like a little piece. Our self is a little piece of that self. Mm. So well, you know where that right away that's pantheism to me, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but in that, I could hear. I mean, you can see his desire to make sense of it all. Yeah. He's trying to reconcile something transcendent. He <laughs> and, is. And yeah. as Catholics, we kind of have we know what that is, and so you can put it in its proper place. Right. But it got me going. Like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, these simple might be simple, but they're not simple. Like, okay, what is the self? Right. <laughs> like, what is the Catholic Church? So, like, I'm like, I'm having to like go to the Catechism and right. looking up what is the soul. What is the what is the another about? composite body and soul composite? You're talking yeah. composites yeah. of right, the other right. Part. Is you know, so I I basically was looking at everything from fundamentals of the Catholic faith to the Catechism to Saint Thomas Aquinas, right. To, Saint Who's always Augustine. asking questions? <laughs> yeah, and right. so because I I felt that way, like okay, what is is this even? Is this all terrible? Right? If you listen to some of Schwartz's stuff, or is it? Uh, can it be reconciled? Did he dis- inadvertently discover something pretty profound and about the self, and he just attributed it in this way? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and and so I, I I think that is kind of what happened, and mm-hmm. so. I I actually believe that the self needs redemption. And that would be another thing that he says that I disagreed with. It. He would say the self is undamaged and needs mm-hmm. there wouldn't be a need for a kind of a redemption. Uh, I don't know if he says that explicitly, but pretty, pretty implicit. Um, and I would say even that our hearts can be hardened, right? Our hearts can be turned away from God. And so they, even if you have those qualities because we're created in God's image, we we can still be um, uh, in trouble and, and sinful and so on. So um, it really got me looking at what is the self, what is the soul, how does it work? And I have a little diagram in the book that is my best effort at the moment and may get adapted and may change over time, but it's my best effort to try to make sense of, of how that all lands. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, and, you know, I had a few different people look at it and, and, and you know, tell me, you know, is it, problematic here or not theologically or philosophically or whatnot but um to really understand that heart and and to understand where emotions fall into the soul and where our thoughts do and and so like what are we made of in a sense and how does the will play into it and so where is the will located and where you know this kind of thing so i mean i it it opens up to get into a whole course or something in philosophy but but i but but I, i i came to see that um, Christ was ultimately the best example, and I thought the perfect example of what it means as a human being to be perfectly, as uh, Schwartz would say, in self, or to be perfectly integrated, mm-hmm. uh, would be a better way to put it, um, that Christ was the example, the, the uh, par excellence, you know, of what, what it means, and uh, to be a fully integrated human being. Um, as well, he is, I thought, the example of what it means uh, really to, for the inmost self to be fully alive. 
And so what I decided to do, and I forget which chapter I do it in, but um, early on, uh, I did a, a little mini phenomenological analysis of Jesus in the Gospels mm. in one of the chapters. And uh, what I, because my dissertation was actually um, uh, that I did at the University of Georgia was a phenomenological uh, study on male survivors of sexual assault. Actually. And what does phenomenal, phenomenological mean? Yeah, so it means it's a type of, uh, I guess, a philosoph philosophical approach uh, or a research approach that is based on the lived experience of people. So what you would, so if you were studying, like in my case, if I'm studying um, men, I was studying men who had been abused and how they had healing in relationships. So mm -hmm. I interviewed couples. So you want to like interview as many couples as you can that had that experience and you find out, okay, what are the core elements that are common to all? And so you get at what is the actual phenomenon of this experience. Okay. And yeah, so th I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And and you'd see like the opposite is the way that people would used to do research, right? Um, in the past, where there was an assumption that you knew of truth, and the truth was to be discovered. So you did, you would do like you know some kind of experiment to determine what was true, versus a phenomenological approach is you're going more from the ground up. You're not you're not assuming any truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you're discovering the truth on the ground up. So it's kind of almost the difference between like Plato and Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. Like where Aristotle's looking at all the examples to understand what is what is uh, a form, whereas Plato thinks forms are like way out there and mm -hmm. outside of reality or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, so so I, this so I, I thought, well, uh, if I did a phenomenological an analysis of Jesus and the Gospels, <laughs> I would have a, a, the, the best example of what it means to be uh, the inmost self active, the human being fully acting from self. And so I came up with, uh, and I'm not going to be able to rhyme them all off now right. in the book, but I came up with what I saw as the key elements uh, of Christ, you know, that he was a protector, that he was a, um, a lover, mm -hmm. that he was a, um, uh, the, you know, a aspects of, of who he was in all these different examples, that he, he was a seeker, like he, seek, he, he sought out the lost, for example. And so all those elements that Christ was in the Gospels, we are to be a to ourselves and mm -hmm. our parts, and then of course we're to be to others, and and so that really, uh, I, I would never call that fluff because I would say Christ was sometimes very impassioned. So when Christ was angry at the in the temple, right, mm -hmm. and in that famous example, he could be angry and be in self. He was, mm -hmm. I believe, anyway. Mm -hmm. He wasn't like it wasn't a part of Christ that was burdened with something that then took over mm -hmm. and now he's angry, okay. right? That wasn't what happened. It was, he he was angry and in a proper way angry because there was an injustice and anger properly helps us right injustices mm -hmm. and that's what Christ did. Mm -hmm. And so there was one, we saw a part of Christ with his anger being, being evident. And then other examples of Christ, though, where he's forgiving the woman at the well or, he's for, or the woman being stoned or whatnot, we see examples of Christ being um, showing mercy mm. and, and, and helping people toward healing. Christ is the healer. Mm -hmm. you know, so we, we see different parts of Christ, and in every example, he is self-led. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Wow. That's beautiful. I, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about the litanies. Yeah. And and yeah. how did that become a part of your overall focus on all of these things? I mean, the book is called Litanies of the Heart. Yeah. And talking about the softening and that kind of thing. How, how do litanies come into it and what are the litanies in the book? Yeah. So the litanies are something that I wrote a couple of years ago, those prayers. So there's three prayers. And uh, there's the litany of the wounded heart, the litany of the fearful heart, and the litany of the closed heart. And initially, when I wrote them, I was thinking about attachment theory. <laughs> attachment theory is a whole, you know, a, a psychological approach that is, again, I just find super insightful and interesting and powerful and based on research that we, because of our, our world situation, uh, uh, you know, we all experience trauma. And so we all have insecurities. And so when we're children, uh, whether it's being bullied at school or if it's just our mom snapping at us or something, right? We're, it's, it doesn't have to be a big trauma, but we all experience these, these experiences that cause us to doubt ourselves or to feel unsafe or whatnot. And so as a result, we adapt 
by having these insecure attachment styles, mm. right? So we can become either uh, very avoidant, right? So we, we just basically hide away or we retreat or we just isolate or we can become anxious and we become very, you know, very reactive to how everybody feels or thinks or we, we become just very easily hurt by others you know, as a, we're just a very anxious style. So you can have somebody... Or D, all of the above. Or you could have both, which is, <laughs> yeah, the disorganized style. So you have a bit, you flip between the two. Yeah. And, you know, and see in couples, right, you usually have one member of the couple is avoidant and the other one's anxious. And so you kind of have the kind of the withdrawer and then the pursuer and then they're chasing each other and it leads to problems. So this this whole element of a- attachment theory, I, I, I just find profound and useful because the goal of attachment theory is to help people develop secure attachment. When you're a child, hopefully most of us have some level, right? We unless we're raised, you know, with by wolves or something, right. we, we have some attachment, you know, as, along with the insecurity. So um, when we when we're securely attached, we feel safe, we feel seen, we feel known, we're encouraged, we, we, we're just loved, you know. And so we know we can be vulnerable, and we're not going to be hurt by it by some by the person we love, or we know we can we can share and, and this kind of thing and. And, 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 and it, it's just, it's, I think it's how we're designed mm-hmm. to be attached. So then it got me thinking, well, um, that must have been how it was for Adam and Eve in the garden <laughs> originally, right? They were secure attachment with God ultimately, and they were in secure attachment, I'm assuming, with each other. Mm-hmm. And so uh, even if it was a, an, uh, I like to think of Adam and Eve as almost immature in a sense, like they're young almost. Mm-hmm. And, but s- despite that youth, like they were, they, they were securely attached. And then with the fall, Basically, they lost their attachment to God in the way they had it. They lost even their attachment to each other in a certain respect. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have basically we have trauma now enters the world. So I coined the term original trauma because mm-hmm. yes, it's sin, but there's also just the sense of like now we're traumatized, and as a result, mm-hmm. there's like Cain and Abel and that murder and all. There's ongoing, another trauma. Like, all you know, kinds of things. Yeah, yeah just perpet- trauma perpetuates often more trauma, and so um, what. Christ does is he reconciles us back to God, right? So he he's calling us, his whole major purpose, right, in coming is to bring us back into relationship with God so that we can have a secure attachment with God. But of course, we don't. Even I think most of us, even if we say we love God and God loves us and we pray all the time, there is some part of us that <laughs> is disconnected because we're human and everything. Mm-hmm. So... The litanies, um, the three litanies are designed from the perspective of each of those three insecure attachments, and they're directed to Jesus. So they're, you're praying to Jesus, and you, the prayers move you. There's a few stages, mm-hmm. and it moves you into secure attachment with Jesus. Or okay. It invites you to that. I do want to ask a question about litanies. I've prayed yeah. a few in yeah. my Catholic life, and I love them, but there are times— when I'm connecting to the litany and then I'm not connecting to the litany. And I, a part mm. of me, I love right. that. I'm going to use that all the time now. A part of me feels that these are not my words. I'm not speaking from my heart yet. Mm. Right. But in time, does that change? In time, will the litany feel more authentic? Like, I'm saying this from me to you, God? Or am I just reading words from another and I'm just reading someone's words so from I'm me gonna, to you? you know? I'm going to invite you to pray these litanies and let me know what you think because okay. I think... Should I pray it now? I love... <laughs> by the way, I have... Oh, yeah, I would love that. I, I love litanies in general, so I've always had a fondness for them. And You're like so them. Byzantine. <laughs> Which one should I read? But, like, what do you think would be the most appropriate? Well, you know, do you, do you feel like... Because I think you, it changes. Are different. We have different insecure attachments at different times and that. And so you might feel f- a little more fearful today. You might feel a little more wounded tomorrow or closed the next mm-hmm. day. So it's a little bit which one you think might just be to you right mm. now. Where, where are you at? Are you feeling? <laughs> oh, I'm always wounded. You're always wounded. So wounded, yeah. the, love to do the wounded, uh, litany of the wounded heart. And, and I think that it's written in a language that is a little bit different than that. Like if you do the litany of the, you know, um, of the Virgin Mary or the litany yeah, of... Yeah, like the like, names of Christ. Yeah. They're very formal and okay. very like written in church, you know, you know style of language mm-hmm, that sure. might feel less like you would speak. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's the case so much with these. Yes, it's a formal prayer that you pray. Mm-hmm. I would say if there's any lines you don't like, you know, you don't have to do them. Um, but most people are moved, I found have been very moved by it because... The whole thing is it's really based on, A, some some attachment theory, sure, uh, but also um, 
I think I was moved by all the clinical experiences that I've had and listening to people and their cries out and the things that they've said that that just sort of spoke to me. So I feel like and my own belief is that the Holy Spirit guided me to write these and that he drew on that experience so that it would feel authentic to people so they could relate to it. Well, before we share one, because yeah. I do think maybe we have already invoked um, some curiosity in our viewers and listeners that they may want to hear uh, a sample and maybe not you know, the whole thing. Um, but here's what I, I would like to offer as a benefit to a litany, yes. because we are already <laughs> having a dialogue within our heads all the time. We're, many of us are unfortunately prone to this negative self-talk. We, we do have a little bat and we're beating ourselves up. And now we know why we, it's, it's a part who's trying, he's executing a role of with a protection sort of origin to us. But now we see, you know, maybe we can unpack that a little bit, but we're already using words negatively in our minds. So what to me, a litany is like, now let me give you some good words to say for once. Like let's put this negative self-talk, give it a rest and try other words that are healing, yeah, loving, nurturing, yeah. Yeah. because if you can talk negatively you can talk positively. Right. You know, there's there's always two directions. Mm. I've always believed and realized over time that if I can recall a painful memory that brings a, a, a present day negative reaction, well, then it stands to reason. Couldn't I recall a positive memory and then tap into a positive mm. feeling that is also associated with the memory? Like yeah. it's a choice that I could make, right? right. Um so sometimes I would just think of something that I truly enjoyed. And then I was like, oh, you know what? I, I can recall a warm fuzzy. I can tap into it a little bit. So it stands to reason that we can use dialogue powerfully and, and, and get it pointed in the right direction. Right. That's to me one of the beauties well, of a litany. That's true. I mm -hmm. would say that if the, there's different parts to the litany, and there's a guide, by the way, on our, mm -hmm. on our Souls and Hearts website that you actually can, if you have never done litanies or you, mm -hmm. you're not sure on these litanies, mm -hmm. that actually, like, we just explain a lot of how to do it and what is the, how it works. And that website, but, soulsandhearts.com slash lit. Lit. Yeah. L-I-T. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're free there. Like, you can download some PDFs. We actually have... Um, them uh, auditory, like you can listen to them too, and just pray out because because there's a it's nice to do it in a group or mm -hmm. to do it if you have if you listen to the audio you can do the responses or mm -hmm. you can do the mm -hmm. and so you feel like you ha you get that back and forth. I mean you can do it by yourself of course, sure, sure. but the back and forth is kind of nice I think in a litany. But mm -hmm. but to your point though I think the beginning part of each of these litanies is about bringing those negative feelings mm -hmm. and those negative thoughts and just bringing them to God. In other words, Lord, I give mm -hmm. you my my hurt. I give you my negative thoughts. I, I'm not remembering all the words. I'd have to look right, at right, it. Right. But like it's it's you you it starts off by like I'm giving it to you. So it's not just a, let's replace our negative thoughts with happy thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's like no, I'm gonna give it to you, and that's that has to be the starting place. And let mm -hmm. him yeah do the hard work of changing that yeah. heart. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then you're asking. And by the end of it, you're asking him to hold you. Mm -hmm. Like you're so you're moving mm -hmm. from I'm gonna give you all my pain and hurt. And I'm going to allow you now, and I'm going to invite you in, and then I'm going to allow you to hold me. So there's like a rhythm to the litany. So here's what I recommend. Let's let's wrap up and with praying one of these. And I'll let Jennifer, you pick which one. Okay. But I think Jerry should lead us in it since he, he has more expertise with this. And then you will play the role of everyone who's listening and watching right now. And and you kind of prompt us of how do we respond in that kind of thing sure, if someone sure. doesn't have hasn't had a chance to print them so, out. So which one are we going to do? Well... I know that you're... You don't have to worry about what I just said. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you pick yeah. which one is touching you right now. I'm actually between fearful and closed. Mm. Mm. I How about think indecisive? <laughs> the litany of the indecisive heart. Is why that don't we, one? Why don't no. we do fearful? Okay. And if somebody wants to hear the wounded heart, Matt and I did... I did the wounded heart with Matt. Matt on, Fred? On, on mm -hmm. pints. And so there is like a segment okay. that, that, of that too. So it's good to do a different one. I think. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um. Yeah, so the beginning part um, is just like you you read it, the, somebody reads it, and then the um, the response comes uh, where it starts with Jesus, I offer you. In the name of the Father, Son, Son Holy and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you created me in love and for love. Bring me to a place of vulnerability within the safety of your loving arms. Help me today by transforming my fearful heart into a heart that can love you, myself, and my neighbor as you intend. 
So Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its suffering. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its doubts. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its hurts. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its fears. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its burdens. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its hope and all its lack of hope. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its joy and all its lack of joy. Jesus, I offer you my heart with all its love and all its lack of love. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. When I feel afraid, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I don't know how to feel safe, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When life feels chaotic, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I'm confused, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I don't know how to trust, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel hurt, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel unloved, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel disappointed, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When others fail me, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel let down, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel all alone, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel rejected, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel I don't belong, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I feel hopeless, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When I'm afraid of being hurt, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. Jesus, help me love others when it is difficult. Jesus, help me pray for those who have hurt me. Jesus, I know you love me in all of my wounds. Jesus, most compassionate. Open Open my my heart, heart. Jesus, healer of my wounds. Open Open my my heart, heart. Jesus, my shepherd. Open Open my my heart, heart. Jesus, my protector. Open Open my my heart, heart. Jesus, unspeakable love. Open Open my my heart, heart. Jesus, you created me in love. Hold Hold me me in in your your arms, arms. Jesus, you created me for love. Hold Hold me me in your your arms, arms. Jesus, you created me to be loved. Hold Hold me me in your your arms, arms. Jesus, you created my heart. Hold Hold me in your arms, Jesus, you see my heart. Hold me in your arms. Jesus, you know my true heart. Hold me in your arms. Jesus, you comfort my heart. Hold me in your arms. Jesus, you treasure my heart. Hold me in your arms. Jesus, you encourage my heart. Hold me in your arms. Jesus, you created me as your beloved. Hold me in your arms. Jesus, you are present with me. I trust in you. Jesus, you bring me close to you. I trust in you. Jesus, you walk with me. I trust in you. Jesus, you accept me. I trust trust in in you. you. Jesus, you calm all my fears. I I trust trust in you. Jesus, you protect me from threats. I I trust trust in you. Jesus, you delight in me. I I trust trust in you. Jesus, help me trust you. I I trust trust in you. Lord, you are the healer of my soul and my heart. I ask that through this prayer, you would transform me more and more into the likeness of your precious and sacred heart. Let your kindness and compassion transform my heart and bring me always into the security of your loving embrace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So if people want Mm. to know more, they can visit your website, soulsandhearts.com. That's where they can get the litanies. They can also go to Transfiguration Counseling if they actually want to get counseling from you or your Mm -hmm. other therapists as a part of your practice. And to get the book, of course, go to Sophia's website. The book is called Litanies of the Heart. And it's available by the time people are seeing this. You can get it now. Um, Jerry, just uh, fantastic work. Congratulations on it. Um, much needed. Particularly, I, I, I mean, I wish that you had written this four years ago when I first met you. Um, <laughs> it would have saved me a lot of heartache. So thanks for taking so much time to do it. But uh, it's so here our sarcastic now. part. Is <laughs> That's right. Passive, right. passive <laughs> aggressive What's part. Under that? What is that? Yeah. Yeah. Sarcasm. <laughs> uh, but, oh, no. <laughs> but more of a litany of appreciation um, that it's here now and that people can be. I, one of the things that, you know, as we've talked about mental health issues, one of the reasons why we've continued talking about it is because so many people have reached out and said Catholics need to be talking about trauma. Catholics need to be talking about these issues. And particularly, it seems as though there has been an upswell of finally Catholics talking about these things in the last five years. So the book seems very appropriate that it's available now to people that are dealing with these kinds of things. Whether I think you're dealing with traumas yourselves or you're dealing with someone who is dealing with trauma, because I think that this book would have been a blessing to Jennifer five years ago for her to have been able to, um, to be there since she was accompanying me uh, through sickness and health, right? But um, just congratulations. It's a wonderful work. Mm, and I, I, I pray that people are going to pick it up, and I pray that people are going to be blessed with it. So, 
Thank you. Thanks for being here, man. Oh, my pleasure. Great hanging out. <laughs> it's, it, you know, and, and um, we'll have you back on. Awesome. So, uh, again, go check it out. The book's called uh, Litanies of the Heart, and it's available from our friends over at Sophia. And you know the rigmarole that we say at the end of every episode. Do whatever it takes to be holy, and I'll let you sit last line. Pray, that, no, that, that was that my like, last sorry. line. It, it's pray your rosary every day. <laughs> Do whatever That's it takes what, to be holy. Talk to you again in a few days, folks. God bless you. <laughs>